in the specific features. This section describes the Garden of Eden with geographical detail. And then I have a parenthesis, note the names of rivers. It depicts the creation of the first human couple, their ideal garden surroundings, and the intimacy of the relationship. Now, the Garden of Eden, uh, I don't know if we really paid attention because I have to admit I did not and, and uh, so much. But uh, when you talk about Eden, and we do not know the exact boundaries of Eden, where it was, uh, it gives a name to certain rivers. Eden could have, if I had a map to show you, could have gone as far east over to what is now Iraq and Iran. Uh, it may have gone as far north into Turkey, uh, south, down most of Saudi Arabia, and a good portion of Africa could have been Eden. But if you look at the scripture, uh, God planted a garden in Eden. So the Garden of Eden is not the entire section that God referred to as Eden. He planted a garden east within Eden, all right? And that's the territory that he gave Adam to dress it, to take care of it. Perhaps this is where, well, if, if, if uh, Adam and Eve, as you know, they did sin, they got kicked out of the garden, but had they not sinned, children would have been born uh, and perhaps the world population would have done what? Would have spread it from this very special place to all over the world. Now, uh, the Bible talks about four rivers in Eden. You can see that clearly in chapter two. Uh, two of them we know of. Uh, the others, well, as a matter of fact, they talk about one river and it branched into what? Four different rivers. That's what the scripture really tells you. Now, uh, and, and one of those was with the Euphrates, and another one was named that we're familiar with. Uh, you know, people trying to wonder how could all that are connected. But you gotta understand now that the world that we live in now is quite different than the world that was then. Let me explain something to you. First of all, uh, in Genesis chapter six, when Noah comes about, and after that particular chapter, you have a worldwide flood. That flood changed uh, the land surface of the entire world. It shifted again. It changed the whole world. Because listen, up to that point, when the flood came, uh, there, had, there had been no rain. You see that in Genesis chapter 2. How did God... Uh, how did he maintain Eden and the world? The Bible talks about a mist came up, all right, from, from the ground. And it was trapped with the permanent. So it, uh, everything that in the ecosystem that was needed, everything was just right. I mean, it was perfect. That mist and the permanence did not, you know, they, they keep, keep on talking about global warming now. The, the earth is getting hotter and hotter. Um, you know, we, 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 but now we got to be careful about radiation and uh, uh, skin disorders or uh, cancer that come from, from sunlight. You didn't have that problem back then because everything was perfect. But because of sin, sin changed even the physical trace of this earth. Okay, the flood came. All right, that brought about changes. And after the flood, or what we call the flood of Noah, you have several scriptures to indicate that all the land masses, all the land masses were connected. Now, scientists know that from science. Now, I told y'all last week that true science agrees with the Bible. Scientists say that all the continents were together. They refer to it as one big land mass called Pangea. Well, you got at least two scriptures in the Bible that shows uh, during the days of peg leg. You know, the Bible give all those uh, names, geological uh, lines. And during the days of peg leg, 
uh, the scripture says that the earth was divided. I mean, you have a shift here and a breaking up of the continents. Now, let me go further here and state this too. I mean, y'all did your homework. You read the first six chapters. Nobody read the hand. <laughs> you know, it's what we read. All right. Brother James says she read it. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, which I just read, you have a lot of similarities, don't you? But you do have some differences. And what Genesis 2 does, it gives you more details than you have in Genesis chapter 1. Now, I'm saying this to say this, because that's why when you, when you purchase literature, Bible study material, commentaries, you got to be careful about what you read. It's got to line up with the scriptures. Because there's some, some strange tales that are out there. Because... You see, some people are teaching. Well, let's look at, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. You're supposed to have your Bibles, all right? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Uh, Genesis 1 and 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, out of our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now verse 26 is definitely talking about what the creation of Adam. But then in verse 27, it tells you not only did he create man, but he also created the female, which we know is who? Is Eve, correct? But now in the second chapter, it gives you more details. All right? Because you see what? When you go to uh, chapter 2, look at Genesis 2 and 7. It said, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And of course, after that, it talks about he planted the garden east with Eve, which I just talked about. He put man uh, there who he had formed and uh, gives you some names of some things that are there. And then in verse 18, uh, it says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And of course, you get to verse 21. That's when God puts Adam to sleep. He takes a, a rib from him and he does what? He forms or he makes the woman. Everybody see that, right? Now, let me tell you what some people are teaching. They want to tell us that uh, what's in Genesis 1 is different than Genesis 2. They want to say that's a different creation. Uh, they, of course, they might agree in Genesis 2, this is Adam and Eve. But they want to say what you read in Genesis 1 is another creation. And that everybody did not come from Adam and Eve. I'm telling you what folks are saying now. I'm going to read something to you in a minute. Uh, I, I don't have a book, but I got a synopsis of a book. Uh, uh, and, and you know what, what they look at? Okay, let, let's go to the thought. You know, I'm not going to try to, I say in this course we're doing, we're not going to read every verse. It's just too much to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to spend a bit more time on Genesis because it's a foundation book. It's a very important book. But over in Genesis chapter 4, let's go there for a moment. Over in Genesis chapter 4 is the story of Cain and Abel. You already know that Cain slew Abel. And of course God knew uh, what had happened and uh, the Bible said well the Lord told him that that, uh, uh, that he would bear mark uh, because of what he has done And but I want you to look at uh, 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 verse 16 go to verse 16 Genesis 4 16 are y'all there Genesis 4 16 and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So this is not just talking about the Garden of Eden, but whatever God called Eden. 
He goes east of Edom. But look at verse 17. And Cain knew his wife. And she conceived and bare Enoch. And he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. All right. Now, I've asked this question before. We've got a couple of people who have, who have not been with us when we discussed this once before. But my question is, who, and I know some of y'all know the answer right away, but let's hear it anyway, hear what some of y'all think. Who did Cain marry? All right, everybody agree? That he married his sister? What you think? You agree? All right, so he married his sister. And, and that seemed to be so far-fetched, you know. I mean, you know, I, I'm not getting the response I've got before. And then when I, when I talk about that at school, ooh, we that's nasty. He done married his sister. But that's the only way that the earth, the earth could have, what, been populated. And as she said, replenished. That's what the scripture says. And, and so... You know, we think about that being so, well, we know that it's against God's word today, but it was not then. You got to understand, we, live, we, we are living in a different dispensation, and these different dispensations, God, not that God is different, he's the same, but because of man and our ways, he allows certain things in different dispensations as well. Now, uh, you see, when brothers and sisters Maybe uncles and nieces and aunts and nephews, perhaps. When they married each other then, uh, it, was, it was lawful in the eyes of God. And it did not present uh, health issues, uh, problems. The common belief is that if close kin marry today, that the child is going to be deformed or have mental issues. And I suppose that can happen, but that's not really the case. I think cases I've seen on television where they were near kin, of course they shouldn't have done what they've done and produced the baby. And the, the persons were not, didn't have mental issues, they were not deformed, but they did have some health issues. Why do we have health issues with close kin? And so I think I'm correct. I call I call this Night Jones name like because she got a degree in this stuff in science and so forth. But if I remember correctly, because of the different uh, traits we have uh, in our bodies, that is physical traits that, that that carry diseases. I guess within our gene, you know, like high blood pressure running people's families, diabetes. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Heart issues. Well, if you got two close kin that are going to marry, the likelihood of the offspring is going to be what? Greater for those type of diseases. Are you all following what I'm saying here? So that would be very important why you would not marry outside of what God said. That would be a very big reason why you wouldn't marry a close relative today. But I'm trying to think about something. When, 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 when God first created, even though sin had entered into the world, sin did not have the grip wasn't that great? Still some there was some the yeah, purification. As man became more wicked, yes. all right, then I'm talking about the world in general, then the, the effects of the curse became greater. Yes. That means your diseases became more rampant. The bloodline started with Adam and Eve, and then you were more pure. Yes. Y'all follow me? Adam lived 900 some years. Uh, it does not give you Eve, and I'm pretty sure Eve lived a long time too. And you look at all these men between uh, Adam's time up to Genesis 6, these people were living at least 800 years. Their bodies didn't wear out and wear down. They did not have to deal with the contamination. See, the world now is contaminated with a lot of stuff you didn't have back then. All right, we got a lot of contamination. 
That's why the earth has got to be purified in the last days. All right? So you didn't have all of that stuff. And so therefore, close relatives could marry and produce children who were not affected at that point. But as time ago, more sin came. And, and look at the, uh, the lifespan. It, it kept dropping. It just keep yes. dropping. Because when you get to Noah, in Genesis chapter 6, like Noah lived about 600 years. And you, you get a few generations after Noah, maybe about five generations after Noah, you get to Abraham. Abraham lived to be 175. You go a few more generations, and you get to Moses. Moses lived 120 years. But then you come on down, and you get to King David. Uh, David died somewhere between the age of 60 and 70. So there's a progression of sin, greater sin, and more sin, and, and, and the effect of the church becomes greater and greater. So, so you know, he did marry his sister, all right? And, and family produced, and they're able to build a city. But now, some of these folk, uh, and I hope I'm not boring you all uh, with this. Let, let me read something. Uh, let's see, can I find it right quick? I thought I had it. Uh, this, is, this is unbelievable what uh, some of these folks have taught. And it goes into, uh, and I think sometimes we need to talk about this in church because uh, many of the things that were taught many, many years ago that was so racist has had an effect on our race, has caused us to think of ourselves as being inferior. And a lot of this erroneous teaching that made us feel inferior as black people came from the church world. That's what's so sad about it. Yeah. Here's Here's a book, uh, I think I'm going to get ready to buy. This, this is an excerpt. And, of course, this person, he's a black writer I just discovered recently. And just listen to what he was saying that, as he write about what some people had written in the past. He said, turn into the Bible, the leading scientific authority of that period, the servant divine discovered that Cain had taken a wife from the land of Nam. Now, according to the story of creation, which is Jewish folklore and nothing more. So now he's not talking about the actual writing of the Bible, but Jewish folklore, all right? What uh, people missed they put out. He said there were only three people alive on the planet, Adam, Eve, and Cain. That is after Cain had killed Abel. So according to one of the Jewish folklore, Adam, Eve, and Cain. Well, on the earth. Said, who were these people living in the land of Nam? Because you go to the scripture that I just read in Genesis chapter 4, when, 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 when Cain killed Abel and he runs because he has a mark on him and he, you know, he told the Lord, I, I can't bear this. If I see this, they, they won't kill me. And so he, the Bible says he flees, he goes from the presence of the Lord, he goes into to the land of Nam. So he, so he according to this folklore, who were these people living in the land or not? The, they, they would have said these were pre-Adamonites. Pre -Adamonites. They, they're trying to say they were people before Adam. And what they really want to say is that these were people that were created in Genesis chapter 1. And pre-Adamites could be, listen to this, and pre-Adamites could be no other than Negroes. That is, people who had no part or a lot in the creation by God. Moreover, Cain was wicked and low and could have been counted on to marry a Negro. <laughs> Did y'all hear that? <laughs> Abel, the righteous and respectable, would have lived with her in con conference. I can't get the word I was talking about uh, him uh, taking one of the Negro women and making a concubine out of her. Yes, there could be no doubt, whatever, that the people of the land of God were Negroes. Wow. All this racist teaching. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And people talked this type of stuff. 
That's why it's good to study the word of God for yourself. You see, we want these young people the next door to get a good education. Because a good education will, it will enable them to read and understand the Bible. Do you not know that the first school system of America, the purpose of the school system was built so people could learn how to read and that they may be able to read the Bible, that they may know what God wanted for them in their life. That's what the purpose of education was. But we fall from that now. So we want them to learn so they can read the Bible and understand. Because you have these people who are teaching this, and for so long, many white people believe this kind of stuff. And so did black people also believe this kind of stuff. Matter of fact, when we get to Genesis chapter 3, we know that what? We know that the serpent did what? The serpent was the one who deceived Eve. Correct? I well, some people, because I, I got you, I, didn't, I did not read it in the book by this author, but I read where another author quoted this white, supposed to be theologian. And he says that the serpent was not a snake or a serpent, but rather was a black woman that was subhuman below the human. And that she was the one who deceived Eve in the taking of the fruit. And uh, you know, the scripture talks about the beast of the field. And then in Revelation, it, it, it talks about beasts and referring to end times. One of those scriptures talks about beasts referring to the Antichrist, and another refers to actually to a fallen angel. Uh, these fellows say, well, when the scripture talks about the beast of the field, and then the beast in Revelation, said so those are uh, black people. That's what the devil has done to confuse because, listen, racism is of the devil. Y'all hear what they're saying? Racism is of the devil. Say amen, everybody. Amen. But I'm just telling you, I, 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 I thought that was quite kind of interesting just to kind of give you a, a, a little idea of what has been taught and to show you the foundation somewhere. I think I think even I think we all talk about this in church uh, to so that we have an understanding because the foundation of racism was built many many thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, and we are dealing with a lot of this stuff uh, on the surface now. We don't know the foundation. Let's go a little bit further. In the, yes, speak up. So, so racism actually came in from No, no. I don't believe it. No, it comes later. And, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, the type of racism that we're dealing with today in terms of, of a black white thing probably did not, did not really occur in the Old Testament and may not have occurred so much in the New Testament. This black and white issue of racism that we're dealing with now probably came after the canon of the Bible was closed. There's much evidence as you read the Bible. You know, I, I deal with this during Black History Month that several of those characters that we were reading in the Bible were black. Many of them were. And it shows, as a matter of fact, when you go to the book of Acts, when Paul was uh, getting ready to uh, go out on his missionary journey, he and Barnabas, there were men who laid hands and gave them God's speed. And two of those men, I, can't, I cannot remember their names right off, I have to go find the scripture. Two of those men, because it talks about where they came from, uh, that they were probably black. One of them, uh, oh my goodness, and try to see, was it Lucius the Niger, N-I-G-E-R, which indicated he came from Africa. <coughs> Niger would have been black. So here was a high ranking church official in the early church who was a black man who probably laid hands and in a sense ordained Paul to go forward with the gospel. So the type of racism that we have today did not exist uh, back then. 
No, it did not start back at this particular time here. And I'm gonna deal with some things when I get to know them. Because one thing we do know is this. Adam and Eve are the four parents for the human, the entire human race. So all the different characteristics of color had to have been in their gene. Their three sons, as you study, is where at least you talk about three races that are coming from. And so more than likely, Noah and his wife, and we go back to Adam and Eve, more than likely, Adam and Eve probably were not white. There you go. And I do look at that dust in different shades. There you go. And, but I saw something also where the young lady, she's an actual uh, black woman, but she has two white children. My husband is black. Well, see, so, what, what you look at is this. Over the years, there has been, to, there has been an intermingling of the different races and skin tones in a way. And this has happened way, way back. Because there seemed to be evidence that the ancient Jews probably were more dark skinned as opposed to a lighter skin tone today. And what is believed by some of the experts is that the skin uh, tone of the uh, Hebrews or the Jews of the day probably got there from people migrating back down from Europe into the Middle East. And of course, when it happens, you're going to have some intermingling. And over the years, what's, what's going to happen? Your skin tones, if you got an intermingling of, of different colors, it's going to what? It's going to change. It's going to change. Think about when, when uh, uh, think about when Joseph went down into Egypt. And, and then eventually his father, Jacob, and, and the others would come because of the famine. And the Bible tells you that 70 souls went down into Egypt. All right? And they were there about 400 years. Now you know there was some intermingling. Egypt is black. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they show tell me. It's a black nation. There was some intermingling. Matter of fact, the, the Bible talks about the mixed multitude that left with them when they came out of Egypt. So that meant that you had all kind of skin tone that came out of Egypt. But the other point is this. You remember Joseph when, when, when he uh, did not reveal his true identity and his brothers thought that they were talking to an Egyptian, that would indicate to me that Joseph's skin color probably was very similar to the Egyptians. Because if he had been, as we would say, white, as they show on television, I don't think he could have hid his identity like he did. Think about what I'm saying. Okay. Now, back on, on our paper, on page one, look at the second paragraph. Verses one through three tells us that the heavens and the earth were finished and all of the hosts of them. And what does God do? You read the scripture, God rested on day seven. Now, what does it mean that he rested on day seven? He was not tired. God is not a man. All right? He is not a man. The scripture talks about that he never sleeps, nor does he slumber. All right? He rested to show his created work was done. And we believe also to give a pattern to man regarding the structure of time. Because God institutes time. God does not need any time. But it made time for us. All right? And because we're the human body, he knew that the human body would need what? It would need rest. And, and perhaps he did this to give us an example of the fact that we ought to do what? Rest. Y'all do know we have to rest. Did y'all know when Jesus was here on earth and of course Jesus was 100% man and 100% God, right? But he chose to live as a man. So that meant that he got tired just like we, we do. The scripture talked about being hungry at times. And so there were times 
when Jesus got away from the crowd that he may replenish himself even physically that he what? That he rests. You can do you can do so much church work until you can have a breakdown. And, and, and there's at least one person in the Bible is not a well-known character. That's what some of the people believe that his sickness was caused by all the stress. So God has even taught us how to work, to rest. We're not to work, 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 work all the time. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Amen. Sometimes you need to take a break. Sometimes you need to rest your mind. You need to rest your body. Yes, and, and this is still Bible class, y'all. Yes. Amen. Amen. You, 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 sometimes you have, have, to, have to do that. On your job. Uh, don't y'all let these folks run y'all crazy. Amen. Don't let them run you into the ground. They're 24 hours in a day. And you can only do so much in a day's time. Now I come from a background of Education, education, taught school, and so forth, and it is quite stressful. And uh, when I was teaching, most of my teaching career, because I started as pastor of this church at the age of 27, and so I, I've been teaching about six years when I started pastoring. So I mean, I got two stressful jobs. Got two, which meant that I had to be careful. And I was a lot younger at times, so I could take more in one sense. But I had to learn I couldn't do everything. Just couldn't do it. And the demands on the job were becoming greater. The demands for the church were becoming greater. So I made my mind, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. The principal was saying, be, be called for this report, called for that report, called for all this stuff. Teachers getting all upset angry and so forth and I take all this stuff home and look uh i grade some papers at home sometime a lot of time i wasn't grading the papers at home now that was just me and and i wasn't slacking off in teaching because i believe in teaching every day from bell to bell you talk to my phone student they tell you i talk from bell to bell that's right. Worked them from bell to bell to the last day of the year. Oh, I did teach you that. That one. I did that one. There go another one of my former students. And, and, and guess what? She was quiet then. She was so quiet until she came, I couldn't even remember her. That she didn't tell. It, it's something how she changed. <laughs> and I'm trying to teach her all over again. What? I'm quiet. No. Yeah, keep going. Let's keep, keep going. Be quiet now. <laughs> so what I but what I was saying that when I was teaching though, uh, a lot of time I had all this stuff to be turned in. And I just said, well, I can't do all this. And so what I could do, I did. And then sometimes Trump's come and say, Reverend, you know you didn't turn in. Say, so, oh yeah, I didn't turn. Let me do it right now. That's how I handle it. You, you have to know how to survive. Amen. All right. Now God rested, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified. Sanctified means set apart. Here again, if you look, they said God sanctified, set apart the seventh day because it was a gift to man for rest and replenishment. And most of all, because the Sabbath is a shadow. Now listen to this. It is a shadow of the rest available through the person and the work of Christ. Again, uh, God cannot be conceived as rest or need rest through either exhaustion, exhaustion or fatigue. Uh, skip down under that scripture. You can read it. Jim Swagger in his commentary on Genesis says, Incidentally, a morning here for the Sabbath is implied. Now you know in, in, in uh, chapter 1 and you see it somewhere in chapter 2, it talks about the morning and the evening. So he says that when we get here in chapter 2, he says a morning here for the Sabbath day is implied, but no evening as with the other days is implied. The Sabbath is actually eternal. 
It foretells, it foretells Christ, the true Sabbath, in whom God rests and in whom believers rest. This is God's own rest. You can see this in Hebrews chapter 4. When he said that God rested on the Sabbath day from all his work, which he has made, I think we can derive, this is what Jim Swagg is just saying, we can derive from this phrase that he has not created new universes. So you see, he created the heavens and the earth. All right, and then you go through the six days where he creates different aspects of his creation. But what this theologian is saying, the Sabbath is, is really showing he's not creating new universes now. Since that time, he has given himself to the new work of upholding his creation. So here's the question that comes about all the time. Because we know now, when we talk about the Sabbath day here, which is day seven, which would be our Saturday today, uh, at this point, you did not have the law. All right? But when the law was created, the Mosaic law, we know within the Ten Commandments, they remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And so, uh, you know, you have various groups that say we ought to worship on what? Saturday and that you are in violation of the law when you do not worship on Saturday and uh, you got you know we know it's the seventh day Adventists and we don't you know we don't fight religious groups and churches before, <laughs> but we know that they believe that but you have a couple of Pentecostal groups I know uh, there's a church up in Chicago it's a Pentecostal group and they worship on Saturday. Because they say, you got to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, <coughs> the question is, does God require Sabbath-keeping Christians? Are we in violation because we have church on Sundays and not on Saturday? And the scripture says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Mother James said, no violation. All right. Come on. I want to hear from y'all. What y'all say? The question, are we in violation? But worshiping on Sunday rather than on Saturday. trying to say that's the only Ten Commandments. Ten commandments yes. okay. uh, the only Ten Commandments that uh, I'm not going to say that we don't follow. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Now, I hadn't thought about that one, but I, I know where you're going with that. Yeah. Anybody else? Sabbath made, okay. All right. Speak up, I want everybody here. It's not good, good that the you to come without coming from the heart. And I take that by saying that God knows your dedication and devotion to what you're trying to do. Okay. Anybody else? Now, let's go to a statement that was made earlier. Jesus, you stated, came to do what? To fulfill the law, not to destroy it. Um, now we gotta understand what that means too. Now uh, you find other passages that let us know we are not bound by the law, but you gotta understand what that really means, because he didn't throw the law out per se. All right, but we don't live by the works of the law. Now let me explain what I mean by this. When you talk about the law, there are three aspects of the law. You got the ceremonial law. Uh, you have the moral law. You even have dietary laws. The only aspect of the law 
that we are to keep now would be the moral. Now please understand the meaning by this, because to give an example of a moral, like, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill. That's moral. The moral law, it continues. The difference in the law and grace is that we do not strive to please God with our works. All right? We have to accept salvation freely, which is the grace of God. It's not by our works of righteousness. You cannot live on your own a righteous life to please God. The Spirit of God has to come and clean you, live within you, that you satisfy through the blood of Jesus the requirements of the law. Now, so the moral law, which, because uh, you know, uh, Paul dealt with this when, when the people in Romans thought that they could do all kinds of sin and then, well, you know, just say grace abound. The more sin, the more grace. That's what they were trying to say. That, that, and some people teaching that now. That uh, is not according to the word of the Lord. All right. So uh, if it's not the moral aspect, dietary, the dietary laws, you know, the dietary laws, you couldn't eat pork, you couldn't eat catfish, you couldn't, a lot of stuff you could not eat. Y'all eating all this stuff today. You know, I told y'all one time, you know, if you want to eat a monkey, eat it. That's, that's up to you. That's, <laughs> they eat monkeys in some places, you know. They eat dogs and all them kind of animals. And so, but my brother over there in Australia, over there eating kangaroo. Over there, and he said he ate kangaroo meat then. Uh, next day he saw a kangaroo jumping around. <laughs> he thought, man, <laughs> man, he was all day, man, I ate the cud or something. <laughs> So, so you're not prohibited. God had a reason for that. I don't get that right now. That's a whole other thing. He had a reason why he told them not to eat certain things. All right. And, and of course, you have all the ceremonial laws, feast days, the new moons, Sabbaths. So it's more than just a Sabbath day. There were other Sabbaths. You're not, you're not required. The, when you talk about the Sabbath, that has nothing to do with moral. All right. But God had certain things designed that were specifically for the Jewish nation and not for the Gentile church that would come later. Now, the last page, and I, 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 I don't have time to read all of this. I want you to read this later on. This particular site, I'm not going to say that I agree with everything that they have on this site, uh, GodQuestion.org, but it is a pretty good site. It, it gives some pretty good information. And I think that uh, this information with the question, uh, does God require Sabbath keeping Christians? And he says in Colossians 2, 16 through 17, the Apostle Paul declared, therefore, and this is not King James Version, therefore do not let anyone judge you about what you eat or drink or what or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality I was found in Christ. Similarly, Romans 14 and 5 says, one man considers one day uh, more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. These scriptures make it clear for the Christian, Sabbath keeping is a matter of spiritual freedom. All right? And in the second paragraph, when the uh, council met, you know, because when, when the church got started, it started as a Jewish church. And when Gentiles started getting saved, those Jewish apostles, they didn't know what to, what to make of this, y'all. So what do we tell them to do? How, how, how do we instruct them? And they met. And they understood, even though at that time, many of them were still keeping parts of the law, or trying to keep parts of the law. They understood that it was not for the Gentiles. So they, they, they said they did not want to make it difficult for the Gentiles to turn to Christ. Because, you know, one of the requirements of the law was that males be circumcised. Now, how many adult men going to join your church? You got to they got to be circumcised. You're going to run them away from the beginning. All right. 
So they, they decided that they would try to do what? To abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from meat that was that uh, of strangled animals from blood. That's in Acts 15, verse 19 through 20. But they did not require people to keep the Sabbath. All right? Okay, when Jesus came, and even though he was under the law, uh, he noticed Oh, they, yeah, that's it. They, they were. were still doing the sacrifice, the, the, the killing of the. Yes. You, you remember Jesus got, got angry at the temple more than once, overthrew those tables. Yeah. What was going on? In the temple, they were selling animals for sacrifices. Okay, so they were. Still, yes. Because I know he said, uh, I know he had. No, they were still I, I, doing it. You, now you got it now. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm thinking about yeah. Moses' time. Okay. All right, you got it now. Yeah. Now, so he goes on to explain that if people, because he said every day ought to be a day of worship, is what he says. Every day is a holy day now. All right? And, and uh, that, you know, in the book of Acts, they met daily breaking the bread. And having prayer. But as time went along, they chose the first day of the week as the day of worship. That is a worship service collectively. And no doubt it had a lot to do with the fact that Jesus rose on the first day of the week. On a Sunday. So they chose Sunday rather than Saturday. But listen, it is not wrong if a person want to have church on a Saturday. That wrong with that. I told y'all some years ago, especially when I was teaching, I said, I wouldn't mind breaking the tradition, have church on Saturday, then I rest on Sunday if I go back to work on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> now that would be totally different, wouldn't it? Amen. It'd be a totally different uh, way of doing things. Uh, but but it, it wouldn't be anything wrong with that. All right? But we choose Sunday as our day that we come together to worship the Lord. So I want you, and you can read the rest of this. I put that in there for you to read because that's a question that's uh, asked many times. Okay, now let's go to page two and look at the very first verse here. And I'm going to stop in a few minutes because uh, the mentors are going to meet with the mentees on, on, on this evening. So we're not going to go over the time on, on tonight. But look at the, the, the very first verse I have on it. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now what do we have going on here? We know that God created Adam from the dust of earth. So he created the what? He created the body didn't he? from the dust of earth. But that body had no life. So it's just laying out there. Didn't have any life until God himself breathed into the nostrils of Adam. Now, the breath of life is akin to the Spirit of God. It's not the Spirit of God, but it comes from God. And of course, when the breath of life goes into that body, that breath of life becomes the Spirit of man. And when the spirit touches the physical body, a soul is produced. Look what it said. And the, the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So man is made of three parts. Body, soul, spirit. The spirit comes directly from God. It touches the body. It produces a soul. If man, and I'm sure some of them working, ever clone a human being, he cannot create life as God. Because he cannot breathe into his nostrils the breath of life to create a soul. 
And my father said this many years ago. He said, if they're successful, they might be creating something like a Frankenstein monster. Because the soul, as we look at, and I've talked this before, and got a little bit in this teaching here. The soul is your intellect, it is your mind, it is where your personality, your emotions. That's the soul of man. Only God can create that. So if you create something that really doesn't have the heart, and I'm talking about the, you know, the organ that pumps blood, but I'm talking about the soul here, then what do you have? Then I go a little bit further. If he's successful, it would probably be, no doubt, the perfect host for demon spirits. Demon spirits are disembodied spirits. They have a spiritual substance. They don't have, they don't have physical qualities. And that's why they seek to be inside of an individual. That's why I, this Bible says, I'm just teaching. That's why you got to be careful about what you do, your entertainment, your activities, because you can open a door for demon spirits. Demon spirits are everywhere. And they're all around. In order for them to enjoy and to do their development in a physical way, they have to have a physical host. Outside of a physical host, they cannot operate in a physical world. You can only hear demons speak. Listen to me now. Now I know the devil speaks. He speaks to deal with man. But the devil is not a demon. He's a fallen angel. There's a difference between a fallen angel and a demon. All right? Fallen angels have bodies. They have bodies. Demons are disembodied spirits. The only way you can hear demons speak, he has to be inside of a body and literally use your vocal cords. Or he could be inside of an animal. Because the animal doesn't have the vocal cords you have, but they can make certain sounds. Now, some of you all have never seen demons in operation, but I have. I have witnessed personally. Never see, I forget when I first started preaching. Just started preaching in the Jerusalem Temple. A young lady came to our church at a revival, and she was demon possessed. Her voice went from high pitched soprano all the way to baritone. I heard it for myself. So they are real. Now, looking at this, and I got on that because I'm talking about uh, what could happen if they clone an individual. Uh, look at that paragraph. So the first step of God's procedure to fulfill his purpose was to create man as a vessel to contain himself as life. You got some scriptures here. And I go, and I go back talking about man's body for out of the dust of the ground. I found something very interesting because when you look at uh, verse 7, and Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. The word ground, which is our English word, comes from the Hebrew Adama, A-D-A-M-A-H, which is very similar or connected to the name Adam. Now the name Adam means man. But you know Adam was made from what? From the ground. All the elements or things that are in the ground are basically in your body. You personally your body is not worth very much money. Did y'all know that? What you're made up of, iron and all the other elements, according to man, when you look at what we're made up of, you're not very, you not, you not, you don't cost a whole lot in that sense. But we show buy a lot of stuff to try to make it attractive. <laughs> We like to wear the blade blade and all other things. Notice the scripture said that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God breathed into Adam's body and, and, and became Adam's spirit. So I just went over that just a minute ago. Um, skip down to one, two, three, to the third paragraph. We're going to have to try to end it here. The spirit of man, so just so, which comes from the breath of God, is for man to worship God. You can read the scriptures later. 
to be regenerated by God and to be joined to God, that man may walk and live in an organic union with God to fulfill God's purpose. Because the human spirit came out of God's breath of life, it is very close to the spirit of God. Thus, there could be a transmission between God, the spirit, and man's spirit, and the human spirit is able to contact God and be one with God. Now, the way you connect to God is through your spirit. You know, we know that God is spirit and know that worship him was worship him how? In spirit and in truth. So the only way you can connect to God is through your spirit. There are three functions of your spirit. Your conscience, everybody should know what conscience is. That's the part of you that enables you to know right from wrong. I don't care where you are in this world, people know it is wrong to steal. It is wrong to commit murder. That's across the world in every society. Even societies that have never heard the gospel. That's because of what? Your conscience. Say amen, everybody. Amen. But now when a person becomes very evil and wicked, the scripture talks about a person's conscience as if it has been seared with a hot iron. So a person, uh, some of these psych psycho uh, killers that, that, you know, kill for the fun of them, can brutally uh, murder babies, then something has happened to their conscience. All right, you have conscience, you have fellowship. Fellowship uh, means it's a part of your worship of God and intuition. That's a that's a, a typo there. It says institution, but it should be intuition. So you take that S out of there. Give a man a direct sense of God and direct knowledge from God. So there's some intuitive feelings or intuitions of things you just know, and it comes through your spirit. So, and I I, I pick up here next week. The Lord says the same, but the way. The way things ought to be is this. Your spirit should be in charge of your life. Your spirit is to be connected with God's spirit. And if your spirit is connected to God's spirit, then the soul, which is where your mind, your intellect, your will is, will follow your spirit. And if your soul is following your spirit and follows the spirit of God, then the body automatically going to follow. Now look at it from this standpoint. People that live outside of the will of God is reversed. Guess who leads first? Your body, which is the flesh. All right? The body, which is the flesh. And then the, the soul does what follows the body. And the, the soul, guess what it does? It has the spirit trapped so it cannot connect to God because your thoughts are away from God. That's why your soul has to be saved. Because when the soul is not saved, it blocks your spirit from connecting to the spirit of God, which means you are spiritually dead. Am I making any sense with that? Can y'all see that? Okay, let me, let me stop here. I see you. <laughs> Hold on. So, so here's the thing. I want you all to study this. I hope you got something out of this tonight. Let's continue to study the word of the Lord. The Lord said, saying, we'll be back next week. We're going to try to have, how does it feel? Now? I'm kind of hot up here. It's still pretty warm in here. It feels better. Okay. Uh, hopefully the next week it won't be as hot outside. But if it is, we'll, we'll set the thermostat a little bit lower. So it'll be cooler when it's cool. That'll help us out. So we're going to do better, the Lord said the same. All right. Uh, got some people that normally don't come. It's usually not this hot. Bless you, brother. Glad to have you tonight. Glad to have you. And others who are here that normally are not here. So I want you to think that it's this hot all the time. You is cool. So we're going to try to do better. Did y'all get anything out of this? Okay. Okay. All right. All right. If you have an offering, Sister Knight Jones, we get it for us, please. She'll receive the offering. Those on Zoom and Facebook, you can plant a seed. 
uh, by giving electronically. Sunday is the Lord's Day. Let's be here for Sunday school and the services follow. Oh, we had a great time this past Sunday. And I believe the Lord is going to meet us again this coming Sunday. May the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and dismiss and pray God's blessing and offer as we dismiss. Dear God, we thank you and we praise you for all things. Thank you for tonight, the Bible study, the people who have come. Thank you for the offering that we're about to receive. Let it be blessed in your name. And as we get ready to go home tonight, take us as safely in Jesus' name. Amen.